Okay, so um, I just kind of want to quickly go over the five vocab terms from last time. And then um, I've got a list of things on the board that we might uh, discuss as regards why it's our gas OC. And if you have other ideas, other things that you want to talk about or ask about, that's fine too. Um, this is just to give us a starting point. All right, but so Creole, can you remember what, a cre what Creole means? Are we talking about the people or the language itself? Um, if you know, if you know both, give me both. Um, I know Creole is basically what um, Antoinette was, mm -hmm. but she was between, she was mixed with Jamaican and like, um, the other. she was mixed, and I think the Creole mm -hmm. language was, no, yes. right. <laughs> <laughs> but I know we talked about it. Two linguistic languages meet French plus Woods, West Indian language. Um, that's what we said. Yeah, so, so yeah, so yeah, Creole, Creole in language is um, yeah, kind of like um, it's like a kind of blend of two different languages, mm -hmm. two or more different languages. Um, a Creole, when we're talking about a Creole, it's a person. Yeah, Antoinette is a Creole, mm -hmm. but a Creole is not someone who is a mixed race. Mm -hmm. A Creole is someone who, is, as I said, is a white person uh, born in, uh, basically born in the colonies, right? And yeah, um, th 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 this, this definition definitely applies to Antoinette. Okay. All right, second wave feminism. What was second wave feminism? Two ways to focus the second wave feminism. <laughs> but the second wave feminism uh -huh. is equality between sexes. Like, mm -hmm. So basically, middle class women rights to fulfillment. Yes. And what time period are we talking about with uh, uh, second wave feminism? 1960s? Through the 1990s? Can't yeah, know. yeah, roughly. Yeah, like, like both the, the late 50s to early 90s. Yeah. Be, you know, like the, when the second wave of feminism is done. And yet, the second wave feminists don't, like, they didn't go away, they're still around. But there have been other feminisms that have emerged since. Okay, good. And so, like, that relates to the novel that it's very much concerned with, you know, the problems, um, emotional and otherwise, of an upper middle class female protagonist, right? Right. Who was Mr. Mason? He married his um, Antoinette the mom? Yes. But that's all I can remember. <laughs> okay, so Mr. Mason represents the new class of English coming in, right? Mm -hmm. So you had those the Anglo West Indians before who um, owned the slave plantations. And then after 1833, when slavery was abolished, um, a new class of British start coming to the Caribbean. Um, and they're primarily interested in, um, they're, 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 they're more middle class than the old Anglo West Indians were. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, they're coming and starting businesses that we can see that Mr. Mason uh, is essentially kind of what, like, not only does he replicate a lot of the same prejudices the old Anglo-West Indians had, but he also knows nothing about the place, right? All right, the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833, what was this? That's also in the <laughs> novel, because yes. wasn't her mom's name like uh, something? Antoinette's no, no. Her um, her her mother her, her mother is is a white woman. Okay. Um, although she comes from Martinique, yeah. where slavery remained legal longer. slavery in most of its dominions in 1833, right? But do you remember what the stipulation they added was? 
there were actually two controversial stipulations they added to this. Uh, did it free slaves in British dominions immediately? Yeah. Right, there had to be that seven year apprenticeship, right? Mm -hmm. Where they were still working unpaid for the people who owned them. And reparations were also to be paid to, not to the slaves, but to the slave owners, right? So this is part of the background of what's happening in part one of the novel, or you know, the, uh, <clears throat> the black population of Jamaica is, you know, incredibly, is very, it's extremely restless, right? And very resentful of <clears throat> the Anglo West Indians and the New English. And then finally, we should know who Antoinette is, right? Yes. She, well, she is a Corello. Um, she also was arranged marriage with Rochester. I guess that's what his name is. Yeah, he, he's never officially named in the novel, but that's the character. Yeah, yeah. He's a character in Jane Eyre. Yeah. And there was some other things. She was the daughter of mm -hmm. slave owner. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Old Mr. Cosway. Yes. Oh, I, remember. <laughs> I know there was the end of the novel. Uh -huh. she, she, she was an interesting person at the end. Uh huh. Well, yeah. Let, let's maybe kind of jump to there, right? Like, what is her situation at the end of the novel? What's happened? I, I feel like the way she reacted is because I felt like he cheated on her with one of the maids, but I'm not sure what that. He does. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's immediately after she's given him uh, something like something that something that Christophine had given her, right, to make him regain interest in her. Right. And then yeah, the, the, the next day after he realizes what, what she did, um, yeah, he has a, a little fling with Amelie, the uh, the mixed race maid. Um, I'm going to put that one see what's like. I read it. Yeah. But after that, that's when she started demanding <clears throat> alcohol from um, Baptiste? Baptiste? Ba Baptiste, yeah. Baptiste. There's Baptiste is the, the overseer, yeah. So maybe we we'll start with like these relationships between the you know the servants who work here and the white people they work for, right? Mm -hmm. So first off, I think that you know the, the word servant here is key because they make it clear at various points, right? Baptiste so much as says to Rochester, right? I'm not a slave, right? I'm a free man. Yeah. And <clears throat> many of the um, points about uh, people's clothes and you know, their um, assertions of individuality are essentially assertions of freedom, right? So for example, um, Christophine is noted as always wearing large gold earrings. Now there's a reason for this, right? So where Christophine came from in Martinique, there were on the books what were called sumptuary laws. And essentially what these were, were laws that dictated what certain classes of people were allowed to wear. So <clears throat> people who were slaves or former slaves couldn't wear gold jewelry. Because doing so would suggest that they were above, that they were trying to act above their status, right? So you know, like these sumptuary laws, or it's another way of keeping people in line, right? Everybody can see what social, what social economic class you belong to because of what you wear. And so, someone like Christophine, 
wearing big gold earrings is a demonstration of the fact that, you know, here on Dominica at least, she's a free woman. And do any of the servants seem to show particular deference to Rochester or to Antoinette or to anyone? Let's, let's, let's just kind of go through and look at a couple of instances here. If we look, say, for example, at the beginning of part two, um, where Rochester and Antoinette are coming to the little, the, the little honeymoon cottage in Dominica, mm -hmm. right? The girl Amelie said this morning, I hope you will be very happy, sir, in your sweet honeymoon house. She was laughing at me, I could see. A lovely little creature that's sly, spiteful, malignant perhaps, like much else in this place. So from the beginning, he gets a sense that she's mocking him, right? Yeah. That this servant girl is making fun of him in some way. And he's instantly suspicious. I think that you know. There's also the uh, the part where uh, Amelie has the fight with um, Antoinette. Um, it's right after <clears throat> Rochester gets the letter from Daniel Cosway. Look for italics. Let's see, because he gives one with his father too. So it's like, which one? Okay, so yeah, yeah. There's this. This is where we're going. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. I folded the letter carefully and put it in my pocket. I felt no surprise. It was as if I expected it, been waiting for it. For a long time, or short, I, long or short, I don't know. I sat listening to the river. At last, I stood up. The sun was hot. I walked stiffly, nor could I force myself to think. Then I passed an orchid with long sprays of golden flowers. One of them touched my cheek, and I remembered picking some for her one day. They are like you, I told her. Now I stopped, broke a spray off, and trampled it into the mud. He spends a lot of time trampling flowers, right? So let's just kind of take that and come back to it later. This brought me to my senses. I leaned against a tree, sweating and trembling. Far too hot, I said aloud, far too hot. When I came inside of the house, I began to walk, silently. No one was about. The kitchen door was shut and the place looked deserted. I went up the steps and along the veranda, and when I heard voices, stopped behind the door which led into Antoinette's room. I could see it reflected in the looking glass. She was in bed and the girl Amelie was sweeping. Right, mirrors and looking glasses are also a big thing. He's all over the place. We'll maybe pull this out as well for attention later. Finish quickly, said Antoinette, and go tell Christophine I want to see her. Amelie rested her hands on the broom handle. Christophine is going, she said. Going, repeated Antoinette. Yes, going, said Amelie. Christophine don't like this sweet honeymoon house. Turning around, she saw me and laughed loudly. Your husband, he outside the door, and he looked like he sees zombie. Must be tired of the sweet honeymoon, too. Antoinette jumped out of bed and slapped her face. I hit you back, white cockroach. I hit you back, said Amelie. And she did. Antoinette gripped her hair. Amelie, whose teeth were bare, seemed to be trying to bite. Antoinette, for God's sake, I said from the doorway. She swung around very pale. Amelie buried her face in her hands and pretended to sob. But I could see her watching me through her fingers. Go away, child. You call her child, said Antoinette. 
She is older than the devil himself, and the devil is not more cruel. Send Christophina up, I said to Amelie. Yes, master, yes, master, she answered softly, dropping her eyes. But as soon as she was out of the room, she began to sing. The white cockroach she marry, the white cockroach she marry, the white cockroach she buy young man, the white cockroach she marry. So this, this doesn't sound like deference of any kind, right? Um, in, in fact, like, like Amelie seems to behave pretty boldly with both of her employers, right? Yeah. Like she doesn't owe either of them any real respect. She, and she mentions as well Antoine had looking like a zombie. Yeah. Well, did you, do you like? Do you know like specifically what a zombie is in Caribbean folklore? Okay, so like our image of a zombie is like a rotting, stumbling corpse walking around, like hungering for brains, right? Rough. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and that, that's kind of largely the result of like George Romero movies from the seventies, right? So the Caribbean zombie is, um, it's a carryover from West African folklore, but the zombie <coughs> is, created by a sorcerer called Bokor. And essentially what the Bokor does is use um, kind of special powders, not to resurrect a dead corpse, but to put a living person into a death-like state, right? Where they're sapped of uh, any kind of individual will. That's one of the books I've read. Like the people in the book were basically they were alive but they were dead at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, and um some folklorists think that uh kind of like what really caused like the what really caused this particular folklore image to um be so powerfully influential in the Caribbean was when you know new slaves would be brought over from Africa and they would see slaves who had gone through the breaking process and seemed not to have any independent will or individuality. Now one important part of this process of making someone a zombie is also renaming. And you may have noticed that after a certain point in the novel, Renaming, yeah. Renaming, yeah. Uh, Rochester stops calling his wife Antoinette. He called her, uh, something would be. Yeah, he starts calling her Bertha, right? Yeah. And he said he would, she reminds him of a Bertha. Yeah, it's like, I'm just particularly fond of the name Bertha. That name was, I don't, how? <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I'm just why, trying why, to figure why, that, like, why anyone would be particularly fond of the name Bertha? Yeah, yeah so like, her name was unique <laughs> as it is. It reminds you of a Marinette. Uh huh. Yeah, well, I, I think I think that's also um, that, that that's also interesting. She's often described as being like a doll, right? Yeah. Especially after they break from each other. Yeah, I think yeah, the, the name does recall the word marionette. That's a good catch. So now I was reading her name like isn't that like a marionette basically? Uh huh. Yeah. In a way. Yeah, you know, by by the you know by the end of the novel, she's so confused, right, that she's, you know, kind of largely forgotten who she is and where she is, um, but remembers that she has something that she has to do. Yeah. And I think that, you know, like that this, this whole idea of kind of the destruction of houses is caught up in this, right? So the house that she starts out with is Colibri in Jamaica. Where's the 
What's that? Which got burned down. Which got burned down, yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's funny to live the you know the that one of the most horrifying images from that is the death of the parrot, right? And all the parrot could do, right, the only thing the only thing it could say was, you know, who is it, who is it, dear Coco, dear Coco. So all it could do was assert its own identity, right? Yep. You know, basically repeat its own name. Um, but yet also, what's what's the only thing a parrot can do with words? Just repeat everything. Yeah. So it can only repeat things that it's taught, yeah. So I think there's a connection between her and this parrot, right? That, you know, the parrot, once, you know, once Mr. Mason clips its wings, right, it becomes vicious. It gets nasty. Um, and, um, yeah, and it, it, it dies with the house. Just as Antoinette slash Bertha Right, is herself going to die when Thorn Thornfell Hall, Rochester's family home, uh, <clears throat> is burnt. And what's what's this guy's situation anyway? Why is he here in the first place? Why is he why has he come to Jamaica and then Dominica to marry this girl? I feel like it's something his father asked him to. Okay. He did write to his father like a couple times in the novel, but particularly I don't know. Yeah, he, he has he has trouble figuring out what to say to his father. Does it sound like they have a good relationship? Mm -hmm. I feel like his father sent him to marry her. Uh huh. Because he never mentioned his mother, which makes me think that his father's like, you have to marry Antoinette for some reason. Probably, I'm about to say, it's not money, because I don't think she has money like that. Well, she she doesn't, but the Masons do. Yes. Right? She is related to the Masons. Uh, yeah, and, and, she, and she does own some Cosway property. Like, the, the house that they're staying in by, mm -hmm. on Dominica mm -hmm. belongs to her. Yeah. Or it, it did belong to her. Um... If we uh, if we look at um, the uh, letters that he writes to his father, I know there's one in part two. Yeah, I think it's one or two. My page is sixty-eight. Yeah, I think my, minus minus forty-five here, right? Dear father, we have arrived from Jamaica after an uncomfortable few days. This little estate in the Windward Islands is part of the family property, and Antoinette is much attached to it. She wished to get here as soon as possible. All is well and has gone according to your plans and wishes. I dealt, of course, with, uh, course with Richard Mason. His father died soon after I left for the West Indies, as you probably know. He is a good fellow, hospitable and friendly. He seemed to become attached to me and trusted me completely. This place is very beautiful, but my illness has left me too exhausted to appreciate it fully. I will write again in a few days' time. I reread this letter and added a postscript. I feel that I have left you too long without news for the bare announcement of my approaching marriage is hardly news. I was down with fever for two weeks after I got to Spanish Town. Nothing serious, but I felt wretched enough. I stayed with the Frasers, friends of the Masons. Mr. Fraser is an Englishman, a retired magistrate, and he insisted on telling me at length about some of his cases. It was difficult for me to think or write coherently. In this cool and remote place, it is called Grimbois, the high woods, I suppose. I feel better already, and my next letter will be longer and more explicit. So, yeah, like when he, it is like he, he says, like when he insists to his father, all is well and has gone according to your plans and wishes, right? That suggests that he's not acting entirely of his own free will, right? You know, like the zombie. But I think it's also important, well, one thing that's important to note is that the moment he sets foot in Jamaica, he comes down with fever, right? Mm -hmm. And much of his narrative is about how much this place confuses his senses, right? 
Everything here is weird and alien to him, and it's like it's beautiful, but it's overwhelming, right? Even the food has too much spice in it for him, right? Like everything he experiences is sensory overload. Right? Down to Antoinette herself. But where is the thing I was looking for? Um, I don't know what I'm thinking was where, where, where it talks about um, how. Uh, <clears throat> oh, here we go. So um, a few pages prior, when they're on their way up to uh, Grand Bois, the uh, Dominican house. Um, it's the section that starts with the road climbed upward. So it's back before what we were just looking at. That's the letter. That's Causeway's letter, but yeah, before that. I think we're close here, so um, like maybe back one more or so. There we go. Here we go. Okay. So <clears throat> right, they take shortcuts. They will be at Grand Bois before we are. Everything is too much. I felt as I rode wearily after her. Too much blue. Too much purple. The mountains too. The flower too much green. The flowers too red. The mountains too high. The hills too near. The woman is a stranger. Her pleading expression annoys me. I have not bought her. She has bought me, or so she thinks. I look down at the coarse mane of the horse. Dear father, the 30,000 pounds have been paid to me without question or condition. No provision made with for her that must be seen to. I have a modest confidence now. I will never be a disgrace to you or to my dear brother, the son you love. No begging letters, no mean requests. None of the furtive, shabby maneuvers of a younger son. I have sold my soul where you have sold it. And after all, is it, is it such a bad bargain? The girl is thought to be beautiful. She is beautiful. And yet. So what does this, what does this mean? So the 30,000 pounds have been paid to me without question or condition. No provision made for her. I guess he bought her, I guess. Well, it sounded like he kind of bought her. Well, actually, no, the, the 30,000 pounds comes from her family. Mm -hmm. They've paid it to him. So they basically bought him. Yeah, yeah, I mean, essentially, with the 30,000 pounds plus all of her property, right? Mm -hmm. is her dowry. Isn't dowry like, like, uh, allowances? Something like an allowance or. It is a payment, yes. Yeah. So a dowry. So you remember how when things fall apart, right? With a polygamous society there, and a man who wanted to marry had to pay a bride price, right? Right. And you could you could pay a price for as many wives as you could afford, right? But before you could you know before you could marry another, marry another wife, you had to prove that you could provide for her, for her, right, and for her children. So is this like a down payment then? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Because I was reading the book and it had that word. Like, uh -huh. isn't it like a down payment or like yeah. money that people save up? So it's like a savings, it is, but it's yeah, not. it is money that a young woman's family saves up in to give to her husband when she is married. Right. So it's the opposite of the bride price that um, you know, say like Oconquan paid to. Her to marry his three wives, right? Yeah. So instead of yeah, instead of the, the prospective groom paying the bride's family, here the bride's family pays uh, the, uh, pays the groom. Yeah, yeah. And dow dowries were more common 
in monogamous cultures, bride prices were more common in polygamous cultures. Um, but yeah, that 30,000 pounds is, is her dowry. And you know, in 1850 money, 30,000 pounds is a lot of money, yeah. right? It's a pretty serious fortune. And no provision to be made for her. What do you think that means? Uh, I guess no backlash on her, I guess. Well, the, does that mean that he has to sock any of this money away for her? Or that she still has any control? I think she has control over his money because of the fact that his family, well, no, her family gave it to him. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, it's his it's money his, and his yeah. property. Yeah. So even you know, when she talks about Grandbois being her house, right? it's not anymore. It's his. It belongs to him. Yeah. Everything that was hers as part of this marriage deal belongs to him. And so now with 30,000 pounds and all this property in Jamaica and Dominica, um, <clears throat> he is now a substantial man but doesn't have to, and doesn't have to worry about, well, one, money for himself. He doesn't have to worry about inheritance from his father, which seems to have been the plan. It, it seems that the expectation was his older brother was going to inherit everything. Yeah. So I guess in a way he buried her because he wanted his father to notice him. Uh-huh. Because if he mentioned his father and he yeah, his brother, so like, isn't that your way of, like, basically wanting your father to pay attention to? Yeah, the, the, those, those dear father letters are kind yeah. of biting there. Yeah, it's like, I'm not a problem anymore, Daddy, right? You know, I can take care of myself now. So I think no thanks just, to you. It's, been <laughs> just like a, it's basically his love for his father's, like, Dad, mm -hmm. please notice me and stuff like that. Yeah. And then but by the end of this, too, we, we find that the father and the older brother both die early, and he inherits everything anyway. Right? That's how he ends up with Thornfell Hall. So he is also so in some in some ways a puppet, right? He is also a pawn in other people's schemes, or he's at the very least he's so suspicious of being a pawn in other people's schemes. Um, <clears throat> that it makes him paranoid, and it makes him mistrust his own senses, and it makes him mistrust Antoinette. And it turns out, like at the very end of this, there may actually have been some, some basis for this mistrust as well, but um, nonetheless, right? <clears throat> so I do also kind of want to point to um, The scene where he, he's out wandering and he finds the ruined house. The rope in the road thing? Yeah. It's yeah, it, it's it's after he has the uh, the argument with or after he sees the argument between Antoinette and It's the, the section that starts with, I went out following the path. Okay, cool. I went out following the path I could see from my window. It must have rained heavily during the night for the red clay was very muddy. I passed a sparse plantation of coffee trees, then straggly guava bushes. As I walked, I remembered my father's face and his thin lips, my brother's round, conceited eyes. They knew, and Richard the fool, he knew too and the girl with her blank, smiling face. They all knew. I began to walk very quickly and then stopped because the light was different. A green light. I had reached the forest and you cannot mistake the forest. It is hostile. The path was overgrown, but it was possible to follow it. I went on without looking at the tall trees on either side. Once I stepped over a fallen log swarming with white ants. How can one discover truth, I thought, and that thought led me nowhere. No one would tell me the truth. Not my father nor Richard Mason, certainly not the girl I had married. I stood still, 
so sure I was being watched that I looked over my shoulder. Nothing but the trees and the green light under the trees. A trap was just visible and I went on, glancing from side to side and sometimes quickly behind me. This was why I stubbed my, uh, my foot on a stone and nearly fell. The stone I had tripped on was not a boulder, but part of a paved road. There had been a paved road through this part of the forest. The track led to a large, clear space. Here were the ruins of a stone house, and around the ruins rose trees that had grown to an incredible height. At the back of the ruins, a wild orange tree covered with fruit, the leaves a dark green. A beautiful place, and calm. So calm that it seemed foolish to think or plan. What had I to think about, and how could I plan? Under the orange tree, I noticed little bunches of flowers tied with grass. All right, so we've got a ruined house, an overgrown road, bundle of flowers that he stumbles upon, right? He does not like flowers, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he seems to be extremely suspicious of flowers, right? Like, that, that you know, he, he seems to always think that, like, the scent of the flower is trying to sucker him in and harm him in some way, right? Where did he originally come from? Uh, from England. So do they not have houses? I mean, What's flowers? Do they not have flowers that he just don't see? Well, they're not the same kinds of flowers, right? Um, like, this, this is actually, uh, like, something, if, if you read just about any, anybody who grew up in a former British colony um, and, you know, had to go to school in a British-style um, educational institution, uh, they all talk about having to learn all these damn poems about daffodils. And not having any concept of what a daffodil is, because you know it's an English flower. Um, so the flowers that are native to Dominica are you know things like, like orchids and frangipani, or the things that are like re that have really heavy odors, mm -hmm. extremely fragrant, and also very delicate. So yeah, I mean like they. There are, you know, there are of course flowers in England, but there are very different kinds of flowers. And you would also typically find them uh, much more in kind of like these, like, like cultivated gardens, right? Mm -hmm. You won't find them, like, like, at least the suggestion we get here of Dominica is that, you know, we've got these flowers growing all over the place. But this bundle of flowers, right, this is, these are not, these are cut flowers. Um, do you know what the bundle of flowers is supposed to be, or what, it's, what it represents? What bundle of roses count? Because there's like a dozen roses, and I guess a bundle is a lot of them. So if more, I guess the more the myriad it just shows how much you <laughs> love. I guess how you how much you love them or care well, for them or something like that. Yeah, you know, I mean, that, that, that's, that's a good guess. Okay. And it is a, it is, this is a, like a gift or an offering, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the bundle of flowers left in this ruined place is actually a voodoo offering. Cool. Mm -hmm. And when he asks Baptiste about it, right, Baptiste says, I don't know anything, and refuses to talk to him about it, right? Yeah. Right, he asks, now, is there a ghost, a zombie there, I persisted? Don't know nothing about all that foolishness. There was a road here sometime. No road, he repeated obstinately. It was nearly dark when we were back on the red clay path. He walked more slowly, turned and smiled at me. It was as if he put his service mask on the savage, reproachful face I had seen. You don't like the woods at night? He did not answer, but pointed to a light and said, it's a long time I've been looking for you. Miss Antoinette frightened you come to harm. So, <clears throat> it seems clear from the exchange between the two of them that Baptiste knows exactly what this is. 
he knows what this story is, but he's not going to tell this guy, right? And this seems to be part of a general theme around um, these kind of like expressions of West Indian religion, right? So Voodoo and Obeya. Right, Obeya is the word that kind of comes up much more, um, much more frequently here, and it's used more often in like Voodoo is used more often like like a French colonial context. You'll see Obeya more often in an English colonial context. But what both of these words refer to are what we call syncretic religious practices. Now. Do you know what a syncretic religion is? Okay. <laughs> so we'll start there. So a syncretic religion is one that combines the practices and beliefs of one of two or more different religious traditions, right? So um, when slaves were brought from Africa to the, uh, to the West Indies, they were typically forcibly converted to the, uh, to the religions of the uh, plantation owners. So when you forcibly convert someone to a religion, how sincere is that conversion likely to be? Probably not very, right? So what tended to happen was that these traditional West African religious practices um, and traditional West African gods would be kind of disguised as, say, you know, as you know, Catholic saints or you know, like Catholic Catholic or Anglican prayers would be recited in <clears throat> what were otherwise West African religious rituals, right? So, you know, Voodoo specifically is, um, by and large, a combination of Catholicism with um, the traditional religious practices of the Yoruba people of um, southwestern Nigeria. Obeya, um, which you find more frequently in British colonies, combined um, Christian religious practices uh, with the beliefs of the Asante people of what is now Ghana. And it's first identified in the British West Indies in the 17th century. So essentially as long, for almost, for almost as long as there are British colonies in this region, Right. This is known to be practiced. Now, there's another particularly strong reason why Baptiste doesn't want to talk to Rochester about this. Um, can you guess what that might be? Uh, I guess his family? We don't really know much about that Baptiste. No. So I feel like his family has practiced it before, and uh -huh. that's why, because something probably happened to his family sure. with that practice. Yeah, yeah, and you know, like I said, like we said, Baptiste's like apart from the fact that he's you know he's a free black man who works as the overseer yeah. of this um, th of this estate, mm -hmm. and seems to care more for Antoinette than he does for um, uh, Rochester. For Rochester, yeah. yeah. Um, so we don't really know what that. Yeah, we don't really the theory. Yeah, well, I mean, and, and, uh, can, 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 we think of, can, can we think of another reason why he specifically wouldn't want this English dude to know uh, what this stuff is and what it means? Because probably the English dude would probably practice it out of curiosity. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, he just seemed wondered no, off it to go uh, to this place, and he's just curious about everything, even yeah. if he, it terrifies him because everything is different from where he was uh, from. And knowing about this probably helps him with the okay. knowledge of the land itself. 
there, there is actually a more practical reason mm -hmm. why Baptiste wouldn't want Rochester to know about this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, Obeah was very, very closely associated with uh, slave revolutionary movements in the 18th century. Um, a lot of slave revolts supposedly uh, began with Obeya rituals. Um, and there was a great deal of paranoia um, amongst British colonists and Anglo-West Indians um, that the slaves who worked on their plantations were going to poison them or we're going to cast spells on them. So, in the late 18th century, um, Obeah was outlawed in most British dominions. Um, in fact, it's still technically illegal in most former British dominions. Um, that doesn't mean it's not practiced, and in some cases it's practiced more or less openly. But the laws remain on the books. So, Baptiste doesn't want this white dude to know about this stuff. Partly because if, you know, well, like, okay, if I reveal too much knowledge to him, right, it might get me in legal trouble. Yeah. And even when um, Antoinette is asking Christophine for this kind of help, right? Why doesn't Christophine want to help her? Because it's, if she tells her, then it's basically going to get her in trouble even more. Because Christophine, she's mm -hmm. already known as a criminal for something. Yeah, she, yeah. She, as I said, yeah, she's been she's been arrested before for practicing Obeah. Yeah, and if she tells Antoinette about it, then she's going to get into bigger trouble and basically get trouble with Jim. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah, again, yeah, there are very practical reasons for her not to want to help. But she also she says something else to Antoinette too, right? She refers to Antoinette and her husband as Becky. Yeah, no. She claims that the things that, that Antoinette wants her to do are not for Becky. And so Becky means the white person. So you believe that Tim Tim story about Obeah, you hear when you so high? All that foolishness and folly. Two besides, that is not for Becky. Bad, bad trouble come when Becky meddle with that. And indeed, it's after Antoinette uses the magic potion, right, on Rochester, that, them, right? What's that? He poisoned them, right? Essentially, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, it's, it's not. I mean, it's, it's a love potion, basically, is what it is, right? But there's, you know, the white powder all over the room that uh, is, she says is to keep cockroaches away, which is particularly interesting given that the local black people call her the white cockroach. Yeah. Right? I was confused a little bit right now. Yeah, well, I, 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 I think there, I, I, I think that there is a kind of level of symbolism in the idea of the cockroach, right? Because what is a cockroach? A nasty bug that has to die. <laughs> it's a nasty bug, yeah. I took a look. I, I, I wasn't aware before I moved down here that there are flying cockroaches. Uh, that that's a thing. The big ones. Yeah, yeah. palmetto bugs. Yeah. And so I, I, I remember. Um, 
seeing a couple when I came down here to look at a house. Um, and, uh, you know, just kind of making a mental note. It's like, okay, like, I'm, I'm not going to tell my wife about those. <laughs> They're kind of hard. The pendant on the coat. The German ones are extremely hard to get rid of. That's me, like, a lot of pets. They're, 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 they're the, the little ones, right? The, yeah, the, the little brown yeah, yeah, ones yeah. that's light. They're the miniature version mm -hmm. of the flying ones, basically, but they're just harder to yeah, get rid of. Yeah, you, just, you, you, you can never get rid of them. No, you have to pay a lot of money for it. Yeah, I, I had um, an apartment in, in Queens where I just, yeah, I could, I, I had them like this. They and they're like just around, yeah. they come out more around trees and stuff. Mm -hmm. When you're like near woods and stuff, that's when you're going to more have them. Yeah, well, they, they, yeah, I certainly wasn't around a lot of trees in Queens. Yeah. Uh, but they, they came, like, they came out of this, the kitchen sink. Yeah, they're just, they're yeah. very annoying to get rid of. Yeah, but yeah, so cockroaches kind of are like they're pests. And they're parasites, right? And yeah, you know, like I think what like as was encapsulated in your reaction when asked what was a cockroach, like they need to die, right? Yeah. yeah well, most people regard cockroaches as like kind of like dirty, disgusting creatures, right? Yeah, like some people the, the girl, uh, regard spider as dirty. Nasty and scary, but they kind of do kill flies and stuff. Yeah, so, yeah. But they're gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, like, like this, this kind of like this tells you, like, kind of like what the locals think about Antoinette, right? That she is this disgusting, low, debased creature, right? Mm -hmm. That you know, she's you know one of the last of these old Anglo-West Indians um, who are filthy and debased and degenerate. And putting the white powder around and saying it keeps cockroaches away, um, I think wh what she's trying to do is dispel those feelings of disgust that her husband feels for her, feels towards her. I don't think he, like, when he first was, like, at the beginning of the winning marriage or something like that, he was just confused on her. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he never loves her, right? No. That's, yeah, apparently, like, they, you know, that early in the marriage, they have an insane amount of sex. Yeah. Um, you know, when he's talking, you know, you know, die then die, right? You know, that's what he's, he, what he's re referencing there is... The, uh, the term little death as a euphemism for orgasm. But um, yeah, but there, there's, but yeah, he, he never says he feels any, any love for her, right? Mm -hmm. And then after he gets Daniel Cosway's letter, right? And I think it's, it's probably worth kind of teasing out like who Daniel Cosway is or at least who he says he is, right? So Daniel Cosway, is Antoine, or if he is who he says he is, he is Antoinette's older half-brother. Okay. Yep. We don't know. He claims he <laughs> is. Antoinette says he isn't. So yeah, the only I'm, person I'm, who would yeah. know is yeah. And uh, Amelie also questions whether Daniel Cosway is actually Cosway, right? So there, are, it's not just Antoinette who claims that he's not actually her her brother, right? Mm -hmm. But he has another brother. Alexander Cosway, who was apparently a wealthy trader in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And Alexander has a son named Sandy, who is the boy who protected Antoinette from the other children who tried to bully her on the road mm -hmm. after Calibria burned wow. down. Oh, so we did see him. Yeah, and then we see him again in her memories at the end of the novel. Yeah. I was wondering who that was like, like who was that? Yeah. Yeah, the book, beginning of the book kind of confused me. 
inside. <laughs> yeah, if we look like uh, in part three, the section starts with, I was wearing a dress of that color when Sandy came to see me for the last time. Right? Now, one of the claims that Daniel Cosway makes is that Antoinette, you know, a white woman, had secretly married Sandy Cosway, um, a mixed race man. Um, who, by the way, would be her own half-nephew if Daniel and Alexander are also some of you know, children of Old Causeway. So she said, I was wearing a dress of that color when Sandy came to see me for the last time. Will you come with me, he said. No, I said, I cannot. So this is goodbye? Yes, this is goodbye. But I can't leave you like this, he said. You are unhappy. You are wasting time, I said, and we have so little. Sandy often came to see me when that man was away, and when I went out driving, I would meet him. I could go out driving then. The servants knew, but none of them told. Now there was no time left, so we kissed each other in that stupid room. Spread fans decorated the walls. We had often kissed before, but not like that. That was the life and death kiss, and you only know a long time afterwards what it is, the life and death kiss. The white ship whistled three times, once gaily, once calling, once to say goodbye. So this suggests that maybe Daniel Cosway's letter wasn't entirely lies, right? Wait, so it's, if he's her half older brother, mm -hmm. what does that make sense? It would make sense. So if Alexander Cosway, who's Sandy's father, is Antoinette's older half brother, it would make Sandy her half nephew. Did she kiss them? And probably more. Right? I mean, uh, yeah, there's, you know, the, 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 right, the rumor is, as Daniel Cosway puts it, that she and Sandy had secretly married each other. Did she have, that's the thing. If she doesn't know, she knows of Daniel Cosway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But she doesn't know if he's actually her half brother or not, because I think the only person that knows uh -huh. would be Mr. Mason or her mother. Yeah, well, and she, well, she, she claims not to know, right? Yeah. But this, like, one of the reasons why this little set of paragraphs is so interesting mm -hmm. is it seems to call so much of the rest of the novel into question, yeah. right? Because this is something we've not seen this before. Mm -hmm. We've like most of the novel has encouraged us to sympathize with Antoinette. And while I don't think that's necessarily like deleted by this, because Rochester is in so many ways such a dick, um, this does suggest that some of his paranoia was maybe not entirely unwarranted. And it also suggests that Antoinette had to sacrifice a genuine love marriage for a marriage that she don't want to be in. Yeah, um, you know, to, yeah, you know, that, that, you know, essentially like for respectability, right? Yeah. That, you know, a, 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 you know, a white woman with wealth and property in the West Indies cannot marry a mixed race man, even if his father is rich. Mm -hmm. And then she burns the house down. Yeah. <laughs> and herself with it. I was just waiting for like, there's, there's uh, gonna be chaos somewhere in that whole thing. Burn the house down. There it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's nothing yeah. in stories that's happy in there. Because no. if it is, there's no. something chaotic happening. Well, well you, you, you know, like, at least at the end, right, she's, at least on, she's on some level free. And she's destroying something that belongs to her husband as well. True. What happened to him at the end? Did he burn with the house? Well, what happens in Jane Eyre, which is only kind of obliquely referenced here, mm. is that um, Rochester is blinded. Um, so he's 
hospital in wow. the fire. So he survives, but he's blinded. Um, and um, Jane nurses him back to health and they marry. Oh, I was wondering what happened to him. Like, mm-hmm. where did he disappear to? <laughs> she just burned the house. Yeah, well, uh, well yeah, I mean, I mean, essentially, he, he locks her up in a room in his house uh, with this Grace Poole woman. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, essentially has nothing more to do with her. So he's got all of her property. He's got all of his father and brother's property. He just had everything. He got wealth. Yeah, he got all this stuff. But he's still living a loveless existence. Basically. Yeah. All right. So since we started a little early, we're about out of time. So let me give you the reading questions for the Braithwaite poems. Yep. And we'll see you Wednesday. Thank mm-hmm. you.